All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation um, on When Abusers Drug an Intimate Partner. Uh, my name is Ashley Rumschlag. I am the CEO at Teresa's Fund and DomesticShelters.org. And I'm joined today by Hannah Craig, who is our senior content strategist and creator, uh, who will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A throughout the presentation. Um, we are so excited today to be hearing once again from Dr. Lisa Fontes, uh, a con contributor to DomesticShelters.org, as well as a child abuse and domestic violence expert. Uh, we'll also hear from Diana Fogno, a forensic nurse and immediate past president of uh, the Academy of Forensic Nursing. We are scheduled for 75 minutes today, uh, including time at the end uh, for additional Q&A. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Live closed captionings are available for this webinar. Uh, to enable, please click more in the menu bar and select show subtitles. A transcript will also be available uh, after the presentation within one week. Uh, just a reminder that all attendees are in listen only mode. Uh, so your mic and your camera are turned off. If you have a question for the presenter, please put that in the Q&A box. Uh, the chat box is reserved for uh, communication between attendees or letting us know if there's something uh, wrong with the webinar. If you have some sort of technical issue, uh, we'll do our best to assist. Um, a certificate of attendance, transcript, a recording, and any other resources uh, referenced throughout this presentation will be emailed to all attendees uh, within the next week. Uh, and anyone who is a call-in listener uh, please email info at domesticshelters.org uh, just to let us know that you are on the call today and give us your email address so we can add you to that distribution list. And uh, some quick reminders about domesticshelters.org. Uh, we are a free online resource uh, uh, designed uh, with content designed for both victims and survivors, uh, as well as domestic violence professionals. Um, you may be aware that the site offers a searchable database of over 2,800 programs and resources throughout the U.S. and Canada. Um, many organizations use this tool find, to find referrals for clients uh, outside of their normal service area. Um, if you have any questions about how to make a change to information about your organization, the searchable database, please let us know. Uh, you can reach us at, again, info at domesticshelters.org. Uh, we also have a library of shareable content uh, that includes videos, articles, lists um, that you can print out or share digitally with your clients, community members, donors, uh, anyone else you would like to. We, we highly encourage you to share this information as, as far and wide as you can. Uh, we also host and, uh, and run the National uh, Domestic Violence uh, Awards Program, professional awards program called the Purple Ribbon Awards. Uh, the 2022 nomination uh, period will open up on January 1st. So keep an eye on your inbox for more information about the next, uh, next year's Purple Ribbon Awards. Uh, and if you're looking to connect with other advocates, we encourage you to join our Facebook group, our Facebook advocate group, uh, and we'll drop the link to that in the chat so you can uh, learn more about that group. Um, and finally, uh, we offer free wish lists to our U.S.-based domestic violence programs, um, which um, we, we did a webinar on this a couple of weeks ago. So if you missed that webinar, uh, we encourage you to check out our library of webinars on our website. Um, and that can be found um, on at www.domesticshelters.org slash uh, videos. Um, and the next slide here will show you what that looks like. So you can check out our webinar archive. Again, it's domesticshelters.org slash videos. All right, and now to introduce, oh, excuse me, one, one more thing to, to cover. Um, so save the date. We are actually going to be partnering with the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention again. Uh, I know many of you recall, we had a webinar a while back with Gail Strack on strangulation, um, but now we're going to be working with Casey Gwynn, uh, the other founder of, of that organ of the Alliance of Hope, the organization that uh, offers or that runs the Training Institute. Uh, we're going to host another website our webinar on the science of hope. And that's gonna take place on December 2nd, uh, same time as, as today, so 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And we'll send an email out with registration for that that is not opened just yet. Uh, and if you have any questions, again, info at domesticshelters.org. We love to hear from advocates and professionals and survivors, uh, You know, whether it's you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, a story, we love to hear, it, hear from you all. Okay, 
before I get ahead of myself now. All right, so now let's go ahead and introduce today's presenter. Uh, Lisa Aronson Fontes uh, is a, a popular speaker, workshop facilitator, and senior lecturer at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, she is also an expert witness in legal cases uh, that include coercive control, domestic, domestic abuse, and child abuse. Uh, she is the author, and you'll see her book there, Invisible of Invisible Chains, Overcoming Coercive Control in Your Intimate uh, Relationship, and has dedicated two decades to making the mental health, social, social services, and criminal justice systems more responsive to culturally diverse people. Uh, she has worked as a family, individual, and group psychotherapist and has conducted research in Santiago, Chile, Santiago, Chile um, and with Puerto Ricans, uh, African Americans, and European Americans in the United States. Um, some of you may remember Lisa uh, from one of our most popular webinars, Coercive Control. Uh, we'll drop a link to this webinar in the chat for anyone that's interested in watching that. Uh, and also Lisa recently wrote an article on this on the topic we'll be covering today uh, for domesticshelters.org uh, titled Drugging an Intimate Partners, uh, excuse me, Drugging an Intimate Partner as an Abuse Tactic. Uh, we'll also drop a link to that in the chat. So uh, Lisa, we're so thrilled to have you back uh, to talk about this very important topic. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much, much Ashley, and thank you everybody for being here today to talk about this um, really difficult topic. And I'm very happy that Diana uh, will be here as well, um, because she certainly provides an expertise that I do not have. Um, I know you're here for diverse reasons. Um, some of you are advocates, some of you are therapists, some of you are perhaps police officers, medical professionals, and um, many of you are indeed survivors for sure. Um, I just urge you to take care of yourselves unsurprisingly. You know, this is difficult content that we're gonna be looking at. I am going to be telling some very brief survivor stories. I have been given permission to share those. So um, please know that I would never share anything without permission. Um, so why did I become interested in the drugging of intimate partners? You know, there's certainly a lot of corners of our field um, to examine, and domestic shelters examines them all. Um, I am so uh, in love with this organization. I think I, I think the the website is tremendous. The number of articles is great. Um, the Facebook groups is a huge resource, and the video library as well. Um, but why did I get interested in the drugging of intimate partners? Well, I was working as an expert witness on a case in which um, a woman described to me that her ex, that, that when she used to get drunk with her ex-boyfriend, she would sometimes um, pass out and he would strip her and take pictures of her naked and distributed them among their friends as kind of a joke. And he said, you know, hey, if you get that drunk that you pass out, you know, hey, it's your own fault. And she's telling me this story and it seemed clear to me that, and then, and then she said, but the funny thing is, since we've been broken up, I drink more and I've never passed out. And listening to that story, it seemed pretty clear to me that she had most likely been drugged. Um, her boyfriend was a medical professional and had access to drugs, um, but that had never crossed her mind. And uh, when we talked about it, she said, you know, wow, you know, it certainly could be he had drugs all over the place. Um, and so that was the first inkling that that I had up close um, about the importance of this topic. And when I say boyfriend, I mean a very serious relationship that went on years and years. Um, then I was working as an expert witness on another case in which um, someone mentioned to me that um, she had gotten violently ill one time and her um, husband was also a medical professional and um, no one else who had attended the event had gotten sick and she had um, just gotten violently ill for a very, uh, you know, for, for the rest of that day, everybody had eaten the same food. She didn't have any other symptoms, um, just stomach symptoms, and it caused her to miss her job interview the next day. And so she said to me, you know, I've always wondered if um, my husband drugged me. Um, he didn't want me to get that job. Um, but also, you know, I've been reading about GBH and I've been thinking, you know, this is the way sometimes people respond atypically to GBH. Um, it could have been that he knew a lot of people who use drugs and also as a medical professional, he had access to drugs. Um, but, you know, nothing was reported at the time. We're not, you know, haven't used it in her legal case because um, evidence wasn't collected. So 
I decided to ask my colleagues in the field. And um, I asked people who work in batter intervention programs. Um, I asked psychotherapists and people were saying, um, this is very unusual. It's, it's pretty rare behavior. It doesn't happen that much. But then I asked survivors and I put a call out on a survivor's um, Facebook group, just asking people if anybody had any experiences with this and would be willing to you know, speak with me, to shoot me an email. Some people wrote uh, publicly about their experiences and person after person after person had experiences of either suspecting that they had been drugged or knowing that they had been drugged. Um, and so I think that this issue of an abuser drugging their intimate partner may be where strangulation was 15 years ago. In other words, uh, people are thinking it's not that common, but it's a lot more common than we think and harmful as well. So today we're going to be looking at, this is the first presentation I do on this topic, and we're going to be looking at some of the ways this shows up in people's real lives, the kinds of questions you can ask, uh, what medical professionals can do for you, and um, a lot more. So thanks for being here. So I think providers are not aware because we're not asking the right questions. So whatever your role is, I would encourage you, if you're doing a domestic violence assessment of some kind or a coercive control assessment, um, to ask. And we'll talk a little bit later about how to ask some of those questions, but it could be something like, um, have you ever uh, known or suspected that X person um, gave you drugs uh, that you didn't know about or you thought were something else? and um, see what kinds of stories come out. There's certainly a lack of research on this. I, I found lots of articles on spiking of drinks in clubs, um, in college settings. Um, we've been reading about that in the news um, of, um, you know, Bill Cosby, um, R. Kelly, um, other people giving drugs to acquaintances or strangers, but intimate partners I have not seen um, really anything about. Um, but survivors are saying it happens to them. So uh, our first rule, listen to survivors. So what exactly am I talking about here? What are the limits around the question that we're looking at? I'm talking about somebody giving their partner a drug without their knowledge. In other words, slipping a drug, and by drug, it could be a street drug or a pharmaceutical into their food or their drink, or handing them a pill and saying it's something else. So they could say, here's vitamin C, when they're actually um, giving them a, a tranquilizer, or they could say, um, you know, this is, uh, I put um, a street drug in here, and um, but they're giving them a different drug. So in other words, there's deception involved, there's lying involved. Um, it could be giving a partner a drug once, as this person who I told you about earlier said that after a, a event, her husband, uh, she, she believes her husband gave her a drug during that event, he brought her drinks and so on. And um, she got violently ill from it. And as far as she knows, it never happened before or since. So it could happen once. Um, it could happen periodically. So every um, Thursday afternoon, um, for one reason or another, that's when um, the drugging happens, or from time to time. Um, or it could be happening regularly, even daily. Um, so I have spoken to people who were being drugged um, by their intimate partner on a daily basis and disabled, and we'll look at that too. Um, I, I think it's important to say that just like in child abuse, you have, um, child, you have child abuse and neglects, which are two sides of the same coin. So child abuse is doing things to children that hurt them, whereas neglect is failing to do things they need. And there's also two sides to this coin. So um, there's the giving of a drug that somebody, um, it, that is bad for someone or it's against their will or it's without their consent or it's withholding medication. So in other words, one person spoke to me and said that she was supposed to have regular um, medication and that her husband brought it to her every night, but he was bringing her something else. So she wasn't getting the medication she needed. In response, the doctor kept upping and upping and upping the doses, unclear as to why she wasn't responding. Um, getting a partner addicted to drugs um, certainly happens, happens in tra trafficking, especially, um, and that is an important issue, but it's really not what um, we're gonna be focusing on today, although certainly at the end in the question and answer period, we could look at it a bit if you'd like. 
So why would somebody drug their intimate partner? Like why, what would be gained out of that? Um, I'm gonna be looking at four uh, main um, categories here. And then there's certainly overlap um, between them, but someone could draw, drug their intimate partner to control them, to discredit them with authorities, which is also a form of control, to disable them and to sexually abuse them. Um, so let's look at each one of those individually. Um, but I want to look at it in the context of coercive control. Now, some of you have heard me speak about it, and some of you have heard other people speak about it. But these are some of the tactics of coercive control. Um, coercive control is the control, the domination of an intimate partner. And I, that's the shorthand um, definition of coercive control. And um, these are some of the tactics, and I'm going to be looking at how drugging a partner could facilitate each one of these tactics. So, um, so isolating, um, how would drugging isolate someone? Well, maybe she passes out in a public situation and she feels ashamed of it. Or maybe the abuser um, tells him that he behaved terribly in public and um, he's embarrassed by that, so he doesn't wanna go out. Or she doesn't remember what happened. Um, she feels embarrassed. Um, by what might have happened. He may be telling her stories about what happened. I have not heard of situations in which women drugged their partners. I'm sure it happens. I've only heard about situations where men drugged their female partners or men drugged their male partners. But Diana is gonna look at that a little bit later. How about intimidating? Um, how does drugging a partner increase intimidation? Think about it. You're too weak to raise our children. I'm gonna take away the kids. You just are passed out there on the couch. I'm gonna take away the kids. Um, taking video of someone who's passed out or speaking incoherently to use it in court. You're such a loser, you passed out and you don't even remember what you did. So certainly that, those are some ways to intimidate someone to say nothing of they wake up and they're restrained, tied up someplace they don't remember, let's say. Um, micromanaging. Um, people drug their partners to micromanage them as well. So a physician might slip you know, diet pills um, to his wife without her knowledge to try to get her to lose weight. Or an abuser gives Viagra um, to his girlfriend um, trying to stimulate her interest in sex. Those are just two of the possible examples. Um, degrading, a husband drugs his wife and takes photos of her naked, um, posing her in different positions and gives them to other people or threatens to give them to her boss or her family. Um, drugging can increase economic control and abuse. Um, for example, a husband slips a narcotic to his wife so she fails a drug test and therefore doesn't get fired for a job or she loses her job because of a drug test or because of coming up to work you know, high even though it wasn't on her free will. Um, and this makes it harder for her to leave. Um, another example, um, Marta's husband, Hector, encouraged her to take a nap in the afternoon and would sometimes give her juice as she lay down to sleep. She would wake up groggy from these naps. Only later, she discovered that he was going through her phone and computer during these naps and stealing money from her accounts. How does drugging a partner um, influence stalking or how is it a, a, can it be a part of stalking? Um, once Mickey asked his girlfriend if she wanted to try Valium and she said, yes, she lost consciousness for more than 10 hours. That probably was not a Valium. When she woke up, they laughed about how tired she must have been. Months later, she had discovered that he had installed hidden cameras in her home while she was passed out. Controlling someone's movements and consciousness through drugs is a form of physical assault. How would you, how could drugging increase um, controlling a partner through their children? Well, imagine pointing kids to, uh, let's say a mom who is passed out or who is looking really woozy. Your mom's a druggie. She failed a drug test and that's why she can't work. Just look at her passed out on the couch. So it becomes a tactic of control through the children. I'm sorry, this is so difficult. I don't really know any other way to, to talk about it. Um, legal abuse. Um, about a week before he knows he's going, um, that his wife is going to take a drug test related to custody because he's accused her of being a drug user. 
a man stops by his house to pick up his kids and is unusually friendly and says, here, sweetie, I got you a latte. Um, or, or, you know, and even though they're broken up, she takes the latte, thank you very much, she drinks it, she gets sleepy, she goes to sleep a little later, you know, a few days later, she takes a drug test, um, custody, and she fails, totally premeditated. We'll talk later about how um, drugs can increase um, and be a tactic of sexual abuse and coercion in a relationship. So that was drugging to control. Let's look at drugging to discredit. Um, one woman told me about her husband. She, she had repeatedly reported domestic, domestic violence on the part of her husband. Um, one day he drugged her, he took her phone and he dialed 911 from it. The police appeared at the door, you know, what's the emergency? They walked in and he pointed to his wife passed out on the couch and said, she's an addict. She's, she's just a druggie. I don't know, maybe she called you, I don't really know. And then when she woke up, he said, now the police is never gonna believe you because they think you're a druggie. Um, I mentioned a way it could be used to make somebody lose custody of their children, but also, you know, in other situations, like let's say she's going to bring her kids to school and she starts getting woozy and slurring her speech, you know, that could also hurt her uh, reputation and could be used in a custody fight in a very deliberate way. If I, I've also been told of situations where abusers gave um, drugs to their victim and then assaulted her. She ended up in the hospital um, seeking medical attention, but she wasn't able to, to, to form coherent sentences. And um, the hospital was treating her, you know, like a quote unquote crazy addict until she asked for a sexual assault nurse examiner or, or maybe one appeared, I don't know. I think one appeared and, and got by her side and, and then was able to get the other people in the emergency department to take her seriously. They did a drug test and found that she had been drugged. Drugging to disable is extremely serious. Um, so maybe the victim is giving some victim survivor is given drugs over time. Uh, one woman described that her husband uh, worked in a restaurant and every day he would come home from the restaurant with some of the food that he would cooked and she believes that he put drugs in that and she just got kind of sicker and sicker and weaker and weaker and ended up being um, stuck in bed all the time, unable to work, barely able to take over, you know, take care of her children. And she felt so grateful to the abuser because she felt that he was her knight in shining armor and uh, was caretaking for her in a loving way. Um, she didn't realize until quite a bit later that he was actually um, drugging her. Um, but in the process, she lost um, her job, she lost friendships, she lost contact with others. Um, her, she became defined as a sick person. And I've heard from victim survivor after victim survivor that when they got out of the abusive relationship and therefore were no longer being fed these drugs without their knowledge, they recovered their health. Um, the abuser might even bring them to um, doctors and uh, they are seeking a diagnosis and their diagnosis is unclear. And so again, the victim may feel grateful to the abuser for giving, helping her so much with this medical attention without realizing that he's actually causing her illness in the first place. Um, this seems to me like a, a really an example of factitious disorder by proxy. I've tried to find out if anybody has ever used that term to dis in domestic abuse, and I haven't seen it, um, but I'd be interested in hearing from others. Um, factitious disorder by proxy is usually when a parent brings their child to medical attention that they don't need or even makes their child ill to get medical attention and intervention that they don't need. And um, perhaps this is a form of domestic abuse as well that we should be looking at and naming in this way. Drugging to sexually assault is what we're most familiar with, but we're most familiar with it in terms of people giving drugs to either a stranger or to an acquaintance, not their intimate partner. 
So somebody might drug their, um, their intimate partner so they can take um, video um, of them as they sexually assault them or, um, or take photos of them and then distribute them or threaten to distribute them. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the term somnophile. A somnophile is somebody who likes to have sex with a sleeping person. Now, if you have sex with a sleeping person, you wake them up, right? Um, so either the person has to pretend to be asleep, or if you drug them, then they will stay asleep. Um, there's nothing wrong with two consenting people deciding to do pretend whatever they want in bed, as long as there's true consent. But um, this is a step further, and it is a series of crimes to drug another person um, without their knowledge and have sex with them. That's rape, but it's also more than rape. Sometimes people drug their partner to force unwanted sexual acts. For instance, anal sex. A lot of women refuse anal sex. They find it uncomfortable. They find it painful, humiliating, and they don't want it. And um, an abuser might not take no for an answer and therefore drug their partner and then anally rape them. I have been told of a woman of her boyfriend who she had a very, very troubled and complicated relationship with. She uh, would sometimes pass out and she did not know that he was stripping her. He had people come over and they paid him to have sex with her, which he then filmed. And she only knew about this when she found the videos of the acts. And drugging somebody and sexually assaulting them, of course, is, is humiliating. Um, it could be humiliating during, as somebody comes in and out of consciousness, humiliating afterwards. Um, so that's certainly very, very serious. What happens in drug-facilitated sexual assaults? Well, the intoxication or the impairment can make it harder for a victim to resist. Obviously, if they're completely unconscious, they can't resist, but also they may, their movement may be impaired depending on what kind of drug they've been, been given. Um, and they may not be able to offer resistance to acts that they do not want to participate in. Witnesses, if, if let's say this happens, uh, the, the initial drugging happens in a public place, witnesses might say, yeah, she went, you know, she went off with him to the bathroom and, and, you know, she looked a little drunk and she went off with him to the bathroom, not realizing that she has been drugged. The level of consciousness, the level of awareness in the victim and sometimes in people in the environment, if they're also taking drugs has been altered, which makes it harder to get any kind of um, solid police information and victims may be reluctant to report. Um, if they have taken, if they thought that they were taking, I don't know, some kind of drug um, for fun and ended up being drugged into unconsciousness, they may be reluctant to report because they um, are, feel like they're incriminated because they did use a drug. Um, they may also be reluctant to report because they don't have proof. They don't have clear memory. They weren't, they don't know exactly what happened. And I wanna give a shout out here to this wonderful series on HBO, um, it's very powerful. So uh, make sure you're with people you care for or, or that you're in a good state when you watch it called I May Destroy You by Michaela Cole, um, the brilliant um, actress and, and uh, director. And it's about an experience that she had of getting drugged in a bar and um, not really remembering it and all that goes along with that not initially really remembering it. And even though it's not about an intimate partner, it raises a lot of um, very related and important issues about how everybody responds and the police and the workplace and so on. I just can't recommend this enough. So one of the most common drugs used to commit sexual assault um, are roofies or um, ropinol, ropinol. Uh, has other names there. Um, it's a central nervous system depressant belonging to the class of drug called benzodiazepines. Um, it's 10 times more potent than Valium. Um, and like other benzodiazepines, it produces sedative, hypnotic, anti-anxiety and muscle relaxant um, effects. I'm sure Diana can tell us more about that. It has never been approved for medical use in the US by the FDA. 
um, outside the use S, it's used to treat insomnia, but people buy it on the black market. And unfortunately, it's not that hard to buy. What are some other drugs that are used to facilitate sexual coercion and assault? Well, alcohol certainly is the, is the main one. Um, the one thing that I've been seeing, I'm a professor on a university campus, is that a lot of times young women will think that they passed out because they had a little too much to drink when in fact they were drugged. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a big issue. Um, and of course, people also press their partners to drink um, so they can sexually assault them. Um, marijuana products, um, which are legal in many states now, um, can be used to, you know, depending on the strength, depending on the product, um, to make it harder for someone to resist sexual acts or make, it, make them um, fall asleep. Ketamine, GBH, GBL, uh, other pharmaceuticals that somebody might have for medical reasons, like anti-anxiety drugs, muscle relaxants, sleeping aids, antihistamines, and more. Um, one woman told me about how, you know, she took anti-anxiety drugs and um, her, I think she also took um, a muscle relaxant for, for back pain that she had, and her husband would encourage her to take them all at the same time. And then she came to discover that he had been, when he would do this, he had been sexually assaulting her. And also she's certain slipping something else into her, her um, the juice he gave her to take these pills because these were the only times that she had these, that groggy feeling when she would wake up. There's a new problem as if we needed some new problems um, in the UK, it's been reported and they're calling it needle spiking. Uh, there's a New York Times article about it just a couple of weeks ago. Um, women are reporting being injected with syringes at crowded clubs in a horrifying variation of dropping pills into drinks. I'm just going to read you from this briefly. Uh, Lizzie Wilson was standing in a crowded nightclub on Monday night with three friends when she felt a sharp pinch in her back as if she had been pricked by a needle. Ten minutes later, she was struggling to stand. Ms. Wilson, 18, said she had heard about young women being injected with syringes at crowded clubs and immediately feared she was another victim. Her friends rushed her to the hospital where she spent hours disoriented and without sensation in her legs. And if you are able to go to the New York Times and see this article, there's a video interview with the young woman who this happened to. I'm sure it's happening um, here as well. And I'm sure people are doing it to their intimate partners as well. Although with an intimate partner, it's often easier to get drugs into their, their drink or food. Um, but someone might get a drug into their drink or food and then also inject something to make them even less likely to wake up. So um, what should someone do if they think their partner has drugged them? Um, we're going to turn to Diana uh, Fogno now um, about that. Um, she's the, she, let me, let me give you her bio. Um, she graduated with a BS in nursing from the University of North Dakota and a master's of science in nursing from the University of Phoenix. She's a founding board director for End Violence Against Women International, a member of the board of directors for the California American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, a founding board member for the Academy of Forensic Nursing, and the current past president of the Academy of Forensic Nursing, as well as a retired fellow in the American Academy of Forensic Science. Um, she, there's more. Um, she's a distinguished fellow in the International Association of Forensic Nurses and the American, the Academy of Forensic Nursing. She currently is the nurse examiner at Live Safe Resources in Dallas, Georgia. She was the nurse examiner at the Barbara Sinatra Children's Center and Eisenhower Medical Center's SART team for many years. She provides trainings throughout the country and is the co-author on numerous textbooks and papers on dealing with the forensic medical aspects of violence such as sexual assault. So um, now the way we're, we're gonna do this is I'm gonna ask Diana some questions and, but Diana, you have other stuff to say, um, please uh, just go right ahead. Um, All right, thank you so much, Lisa and Ashley for having me here today. Happy to help. Great. So why might someone um, who thinks that they have been drugged by their partner, why might they hesitate to report it? Or why might they hesitate to get medical help? Well, there's probably many reasons for that. They're not really sure. Um, do they have the money to go to their healthcare provider 
Do they have insurance? Will their health care provider believe them? And would they even do a drug test? They may not know what drug has been used. Um, so there's many reasons why they may not. Um, and that's, that's the sad part of this, so. So let's say somebody thinks they have been drugged and they want to get medical treatment for it. Um, where should they go? Where would be the best place to go? Well, probably if they went to the hospital, that would be the best place to start, or they could call their healthcare provider and get that direction from their uh, physician or nurse practitioner. But when you go to the hospital, um, they are equipped to test uh, quite a few drugs, and they can do that by urine or and by blood. Um, so that's an important thing. Once you get to the hospital, the first thing that they're gonna do is what we call triage you in, which means you go up to the counter, the nurse is gonna get your vital signs and say to you, why are you here today? So I encourage you to be direct and forthcoming with the nurse so that um, things will move along uh, quickly for you in that emergency room. I know it's been hard with all the COVID, issues that hospitals are dealing with. And that's another deterrent or barrier um, if you're thinking about that, gee, do I really want to go to the hospital and get exposed to that respiratory illness and things that are going on? So just something to think about. I would also say that um, hospital staff um, typically, now not all hospitals are, but hospital staff are trained to start by believing, okay? That we're gonna believe what you say um, and we're gonna move forward in a positive fashion with that. So we're taught to use trauma-informed care and uh, all the things that go with this. What is it that we can do for you? What do you want? How can we help you, all right? Now, Diana, so you had told me that not just any old hospital will do. So how, how does a person find out what is the right hospital to go to? Good question. Uh, so you're going to have to do some research, um, and that's talking with people. A good network um, of peers is very helpful to figure that out. If the hospital has a forensic nurse on, then you're going to be okay. Uh, because they'll call the forensic nurse because they understand that there's going to be, um, with this allegation, that there's going to be legalities involved. So they'll get the forensic nurse involved uh, because eventually this has got to get reported. Okay. Uh, the police may have to get involved. So just trying to check around and figure that out. Sometimes you can just call the hospital and say, do you have a sexual assault response team? Do you have a forensic nurse? Do you have a forensic nursing team on staff? Your emergency room can answer that question. Okay, very clearly, they will know. Okay, and, and you gave me two other tips that I also wanna make sure we share today, which is that you had suggested that people could also call on their local domestic violence agency and ask them which uh, local hospital has a um, sexual assault response team or their local police station, um, even without you know, necessarily having to provide their name or anything, they can just ask for that information. They should be able to um, find it, um, maybe even on Google. Um, yeah, it's always good to do a little research and those are, of course, excellent suggestions. Um, you know, the other complicating thing here is you may not know what drug you have been given. So that's gonna complicate this because not all drug tests test for every drug. So um, it's, you know, the most common ones are gonna be found in the hospital. But for example, Lisa, you gave an example of uh, maybe it's uh, GHB or Rohypnol. Those are designer drugs and most common drug screening tests at hospital are unable to test for this. So we would go ahead and collect the specimen 
which is urine and blood, and it would be a send out. Um, but law enforcement would have to be involved with this because it has to go to a crime lab in your state. And this is how complicated it gets. Not every crime lab will do tests for drugs. Okay, typically there's one lab in every state, but um, on the lab testing itself, itself, it's very complicated. It goes down to picograms, which is extremely small amount that they're able to um, come back positive for or not. And these typically are when you come in, if you don't come in fairly quickly after you suspect something, then the urine and the blood aren't gonna do you any good, okay? The drug facilitated protocol says five days out, but the best thing to do is if you suspect you've been drugged is to get in within 24 hours, okay? And I think you had mentioned to me that if people, and of course most people aren't thinking that way, but if they believe that they have been drugged, that they should, try to preserve their first urine. Um, so get a clean um, jar or container and uh, bring that with them um, to the medical facility? Yes, um, I would always accept that from a patient because we start by believing. So the first P is the most important because that's gonna be the most concentrated. So when you start drinking fluids, um, you know, you dilute everything um, that's going through you. You urinate and you lose that, then you drink and urinate again. So the best bet is to get that first urination and you're correct, put it in a Tupperware, just label it, the date and time and that you collected it. And then you can hand that to your forensic nurse or the forensic team um, or even um, the law enforcement officer. Okay, that's evidence. They will take it. Okay. And, and I guess one more thing I'd add, and I'd be interested if you agree with this, is that if somebody believes that they have been drugged and may have been sexually assaulted, they should not shower, even though they're gonna feel like taking a shower, uh, but they should get to the hospital um, sexual assault team as soon as possible instead, because if they shower, they may be washing off evidence. Yes, um, those directions are in every brochure about what to do after you suspect you've been sexually assaulted across the United States. However, I am gonna tell you that um, it doesn't matter to us anymore if you've taken one shower, two showers, or three showers, we can still find evidence. Okay. That's good to know. Um, so let's say um, more than a few days have passed since the suspected drugging. And um, sometimes it takes people a long time to even think that it was a drugging. Like they know that they passed out, they lost track of time, they're not sure what happened. And then maybe they talk to somebody and somebody says, hey, did you think maybe you were drugged? I hope the advocates here are going to be, be thinking of, of um, you know, asking people about that. So maybe it's an advocate who, who says that. So more than a few days have passed. What, what are their options at that point? Yes, that's very common because the side effects of these drugs are you wake up, you're foggy. What do you do? You go back to sleep. And then maybe you have a discussion with a friend um, and you talk about it. And then uh, the conclusion is maybe I was sexually assaulted. So that is very common still come in. We can still help with evidence collection. A lot of this, you know, will always come back to uh, the history that the patient gives us and the investigation. And of course, if somebody is being assaulted by, the, you know, has been um, drugged by their intimate partner who's abusive, because drugging is part of abuse, then it may take them a while to be able to get free enough um, to go seek that medical attention. Correct. And just one other thing, you know, if you have a safe place um, and you suspect that you're being drugged, if you can just uh, take some notes and put it in a safe place so that you can eventually uh, tell the police about it 
write down your symptoms, what's happening. If you find the pills, take pictures of them. Um, there's a lot that you can do too, but most of all, please stay safe. We know how dangerous this is. Diane, I just wanted to ask you one more question. Um, I, I mentioned that I have not heard about women drugging their male partners. Um, and I just wondered if you have, if you have examples or any thoughts on that? <laughs> yes, we know that that happens, but the female, um, if you will, perpetrator, um, there is not a lot of research out there on it. So it is very limited. We know that uh, females can be the aggressor in a domestic violence relationship where the male is being um, abused. And we know that males will abuse males. And that includes drugging, um, as well as domestic violence, physical abuse, sexual assault. So absolutely. It goes uh, to saying across the lifespan, gender doesn't matter. Um, and women abuse women. Um, I guess I don't quite agree that gender doesn't matter. Um, I think the vast majority of abuse, as far as we can see, is, is men towards their female partners. But, but you had mentioned a certain circumstance in which you have seen um, girls uh, involved with gangs or young women involved with gangs who you thought were drugging men. Yes, um, and of course, at least I agree with you. The majority of the victims the patients we see by far are females. There is no comparison to the numbers here. And yes, um, gangs are um, a different being where in order to get initiated into a gang um, that you have to prove yourself. And uh, depending upon the task or the orders that you're given, sometimes it is drugging and sexually assaulting, videotaping, trafficking, uh, depends upon what, what they want you to do. And I have seen that happen. Thank you so much, Diana. And uh, Diana's gonna stick around uh, a few more things we're gonna talk about and then we're gonna open it up for questions. So if you find um, something, some pills, syringes, something else that's suspicious in your home, take photos of them where you find them. And if um, you could also bring them to the police if it's safe uh, to do so, but I do recommend that you first take photos of them, refine them. If it's safe, uh, keep notes about your symptoms, the symptoms you might have, when you had the symptoms, how long it lasted. Um, Domestic Shelters has a couple of articles on their website about how to keep evidence safely um, if you're living in a domestic abuse situation. Um, and uh, just keep records of, of everything that you can um, somewhere safe. So what should professionals in the field do? All of us need to ask the right questions of victims and believe victims. Um, we'll talk about how to ask that question. Um, law enforcement and batter intervention program um, staff, who I hope are here also, need to also write the question, ask the right questions of abusers. Um, when I've spoken with batter intervention program staff, um, and I'm going to be presenting at a conference next week and looking forward to meeting some more. Um, they say that this doesn't is not usually a routine part of what they ask when they're asked about abusive techniques. So um, I hope that more people will do that. And I'd love to hear from you um, about what you find. You know, did you ever give your partner or ex-partner a drug um, without their knowledge? And uh, find out some more about that. And of course, law enforcement also needs to ask that. Um, first responders uh, need to ask the right questions of crime scenes if they're law enforcement, collect evidence and document the evidence. Um, if you're a medical first responder, an EMT, um, if, you're, if you're encountering someone who appears to be high or drugged, uh, make sure you're not making any assumptions about what happened there. And the courts uh, need to be asking the right questions as well. Um, one of the very saddest stories I've ever heard um, was of a woman who had been um, addicted to meth and lost custody of her first child due to her meth addiction, had been clean for two years. Uh, when she went into labor, her abusive partner refused to let her get any medical attention. She was at home laboring in a lot of pain and uh, somehow he got uh, meth into her. 
Um, I don't know if it was, uh, you know, without her knowledge, if he said, this will help with the pain, I don't really know what happened. And then he let her go to the hospital. She, when she went to the hospital, they tested her, found the meth and her child was also taken away. Um, so we need to make sure we're, we need to check our assumptions um, and uh, really look into what's, what's before us. Um, so how do you ask um, about uh, the possibility of drugging as part of a domestic violence or course of control assessment? Um, here's you know, just an example. Um, I might say, um, sometimes people who abuse their partners give them drugs without their knowledge or trick them into taking a drug. Do you think that might've happened to you? Tell me about it. And, and I, I say, do you think that might've happened to you? Because most of the time, as we've been saying, people are not entirely sure. You know, gee, I had these symptoms. It was strange. This used to happen. It doesn't happen now. And um, I, but I'm not sure. And um, it's certainly possible that it's too late for any legal charges, or that may not be the person's goal. But it's hard to think of much that's scarier than being given a drug without your consent. Um, so again, um, if you think um, you, your partner is drugging you or has drugged you, um, save your first urine, as Diana discussed. Um, contact your local domestic violence agency and speak with an advocate, develop a safety plan, um, tell your healthcare provider um, if safe and um, this is the route you want to follow, notify the police or the healthcare provider could notify the police based on your request. Um, I hope that you will um, consider heading to an emergency room that's equipped to respond in this way. Um, I, th I wrote here, don't shower first. Diana says that if somebody has showered, they should still go in. Um, finding, find an emergency department that conducts sexual assault exams. Um, ask for a forensic nurse examiner or a victim advocate to support you so you'll be treated in the right way. Um, request a tox panel if possible in the first day or two. And um, if you know, if you believe that you've been drugged, get tested as soon as possible. Or if you believe that you're drugged repeatedly, you know, get consider getting tested um, periodically. Um, so um, thank you for, um, you know, participating today. Um, what can we do about um, the problem of drugging of intimate partners? Well, we certainly have to keep learning, stay in touch, um, tell our colleagues about it, um, and help other people know about it. Um, there's a copy my book on course of control if you're interested and now we're going to take a little time to um, look at your questions and concerns diana i hope you'll come back and uh, you can uh, answer as well wonderful well thank you both this has been really really informative and we do have quite a few questions that have come in so i'll go ahead and, and we'll just walk through these uh, together so um, the first question has a little bit of context to it. Um, uh, I never understood why my husband wanted to control me in the first place. Uh, now that this topic is brought up, uh, I'll never know if this happened to me. But how can someone protect themselves from intimate partner drugging uh, as it's so difficult to detect um, if they don't even suspect that they're being drugged? Are there any you know, suggestions that uh, advocates can be giving to clients or survivors can use uh, to protect themselves? First thing that I would say is that if you are um, enough at risk that you have to worry that your partner is drugging you, then it's probably time to make an exit plan. Um, and so um, if you can get in touch with your local dom domestic violence agency, work with an advocate, develop a safety plan. Um, other than that, it would be things like, um, you know, preparing your own food, um, not accepting um, drinks from your partner, um, which is hard to do if your partner is abusing you mm -hmm. and controlling you. Um, so I, I, I find it really hard to imagine how somebody could protect themselves in this specific way. Um, I do know of a woman though, who, um, whose husband was regularly giving her drugs on a, on a certain afternoon, they both had off or something. And um, she woke up once with such severe um, rectal pain that she believed that he had raped her anally. Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of things keeping her in that relationship. Um, so when he, uh, another time, uh, now I'm remembering it better, he, he would give her wine and, and, um, 
kind of on a, on a periodic basis. The next time that happened, she took it and somehow snuck away and pour a lot of it, poured a lot of it down the drain and pretended to be intoxicated and pretended to pass out. And then he immediately started sexually assaulting her and, um, and she confronted him. To me, that sounds really risky. To me, it seems that if you, ha if you have to be that worried about your partner, it's time to um, develop an exit strategy. Diana, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, the only other thing I would say, if it's safe, you can go online on the internet and there are some simple drug panels that you can do at home testing. Um, but again, if you don't know the drug, it's gonna be very difficult um, to figure that out. If it's a chronic situation, you could consider testing your hair. You know, get the police involved, but you've got to report it and be ready to move forward. Can you just say a little bit about hair testing? Because I know it's it's complicated, but just the short version. Yes, it is complicated. <laughs> it's not the follicle testing. What they do is they'll cut your hair and you need about an inch or an inch and a half long. And it must be at least one and a half weeks or two weeks after you suspect the drug that has been given. If it is just a one time only, you will not find it. But if it's chronic, it should show up in your hair. That's how sometimes they can tell um, if you're being poisoned, right? Uh, because that's a chronic thing that, that's being done to you. So you could test the hair. Different drugs um, are more expensive. Uh, if you suspect it's GHB, that there's only one lab that will test that, and that's in France. And I think the cost is $1,800. So um, again, it's best to report and work with the police, your detective investigator team, um, to put all these pieces together. I know that's easier said than done by far. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, what about cases where someone tries uh, a drug with a partner and then they go along with a sexual experience um, they would not have gone along with if sober? Is that an entirely different situation or considered abuse if uh, they were encouraged to take the drug, but they took it willingly? Well, <laughs> that kind of sounds like consent. Um, so if... Um, they didn't want the touch um, and they didn't say anything, that's gonna be very, very difficult to prove um, because it starts out as consent. So I don't know what you can do with that other than to um, you know, talk with the advocacy agency, use your advocate, your rape crisis center, domestic violence advocate to talk about that situation. I don't know, maybe Lisa's got a better answer. I have a, a slightly different answer. I don't know that it's a better answer, but um, I think there's two questions here. One is, is, has a crime been committed that someone could be charged for? And the other is, is it abusive, right? And those are two different questions. So it might be that, you know, that case wouldn't get very far with a prosecutor. Um, but still, if, if a person has said they don't want to have a sexual act, and their partner is pushing them to take drugs so they will be more likely to, um, or if um, they're being pushed anyway to take drugs. I mean, to me, that sounds like certainly not an ideal relationship and possibly an abusive relationship. So I'm not so caught up on, you know, whether a, a crime has been committed. Um, I, I'm more caught up on, you know, the question was, is it abuse? And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's abusive to push somebody to take drugs. now. Um, you know, what, you know, what that means for a person's relationship in the future, that's up to them to decide what to do about that. Um, but, but certainly that's not a kind thing to do um, to push people to take drugs so that you can, you can, um, you know, have sex with them in ways that they would have otherwise said no. Yeah. So it can be confusing. It's really confusing for survivors, you know, Hey, did I say yes? Did I say no? What, what really happened there? And um, certainly I would say a, a boundary has been crossed. Yeah, and that's kind of the abuser's tactic is to blur those lines and make it harder for someone to, to 
confidently say that they have been abused. Uh, next question uh, is more about uh, the, the test. So if they were to go into um, a medical facility, likely a hospital emergency room, um, who would pay for these tests um, if the victim has to pay um, that might be a deterrent? Well, if they go into the hospital, they're triaged into the emergency room. Their insurance should pick that up. If they don't have insurance, they're going to get billed. Um, the other thing is if they report it and the police uh, uh, have a case number, they can apply for victim witness funds and the advocate should be available or uh, be able to help them determine what that's going to be or how that's going to work. I, I think the answer is slightly better than that, Diana, um, that the victims um, the Violence Against Women Act requires uh, victims uh, hospitals to treat victims of sexual assault without charge. Right, if they put forward, that's with the sexual assault, that, that it has to be with the sexual assault. So if you come in as a domestic violence, um, we can't do an exam on you because that unit will not get paid. You will be, you will get a medical bill. Okay, so that, that's um, an issue that we're all aware of, and we hope that that law gets changed just to add that piece into it. Um, but if it does get reported as a crime, victim crime should help them with that bill. Okay, good to know. And Lisa, I certainly am not the and everybody, I'm not the, um, you know, the best to talk about that, but it clearly is it's sexual assault because we have looked at that. Okay, and so somebody, if somebody has been, you know, physically assaulted or, or let's say given a drug and sexually assaulted, then they are also a victim of sexual assault and that should be covered. Exactly. Okay. And it depends upon the state and the hospital. Okay, because if they're doing medical tests, um, sometimes it will not be paid for and you will get a bill. The exam is covered, but not the hospital testing. If they take the specimen, law enforcement takes the specimen, that is paid for. But if we do a test on it at the hospital, um, it will not be paid for, you'll get a bill. See, there's two lines here. It's complicated, isn't it? Yeah, very. Um, speaking of, you know, collecting a specimen, you had mentioned, Diana, earlier, um, that recommendation to take the specimen at home if, if that's, you know, in order to get that first urine uh, collection. Um, would that be admissible in court, you know, for looking at the chain of custody of evidence? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is something you can answer specifically, but let's just have that conversation about what, what would be admissible in court. That's all, you know, that question always comes up. Um, you know, as a forensic nurse, I accept clothes brought in or a plastic bag to me uh, when she hands me and she says, this is my underwear. I'm going to accept that uh, and get it into evidence to law enforcement with the chain of custody stating just that. The same thing would be for this. Um, law enforcement will accept this whether or not it's gonna be admissible in the courtroom, that's each court case will have to determine that. Um, that's up to the case and the uh, attorney involved in that. And I can't speak for them. So I don't know why they wouldn't. Okay, good to know. Uh, next question, um, would the, uh, just more to that specimen, specimen idea, uh, would it need to be refrigerated? How would it be the best way to preserve that? Um, of course, put it in the refrigerator. We wanna keep it cold. Uh, we don't want uh, urine sitting out because then the bacteria will take over. So we refrigerate it and then we get it over to uh, law enforcement and then it's frozen. Very good. Uh, is there anything that a victim or survivor could do if the abuser is preventing them from going to the emergency room or, or, or seeking medical help? I mean, 
I think preserving that first uh, urine would be a start and um, contacting the police, which I know not everybody can do or wants to do in every circumstance. Um, other thoughts, Diana? Yeah, I, you know, other than calling a friend and telling the friend, send the police over so that a report can be made. I don't know what else you could do. Um, and that's an individual choice, of course, whether they're ready to do that or not. Right. Okay. Um, I often worry uh, abusers are becoming adept at seeking substances which are undetectable. Um, what advice would you give to a person who is certain she was drugged, yet their talk screen came back negative? I mean, my first advice would be to get out of the relationship, if, right. you know, to not be in a situation where there's possible risk if they're, if they're certain they've been drugged. So number one um, would be safety there. Um, I, I don't know what they're talking about if, in terms of if they're actually interested in, you know, pressing charges or catching them or something, which might be harder to do, but, but absolutely um, safety first. Yeah, is, is that something that's being spoken about as far as drugs that aren't being able to be detected. I know Danny mentioned that even drugs that there are tests for, sometimes those can be extremely expensive, hard to access. Um, you know, is, are there drugs though that simply there aren't tests for at this time? Well, I'm sure there are. You know, um, a number of years ago, Rohypnol and uh, uh, GHB is still popular, but more so Rohypnol was more the uh, drug of choice, if you will, that comes up through Mexico very easily. And um, today it's whatever you have in your medicine cabinet. Okay, that's typically what it is, whether it's uh, some Benadryl, um, we can just drop a couple of those, you'll be okay. Um, just all the different varieties out there. It's very scary. Great. Um, next question is, uh, would the abuser get arrested after finding out that the victim was drugged? Uh, and what does the court system do for safety me measures for victims? Can either of you speak to that? What would happen next if, if uh, you know, they were charged with that specific crime? Or if they even would be charged? <laughs> well, there's probably more than just the drugging uh, that's been going on. So there has to be an investigation. And that those things don't happen overnight. Um, so uh, whether or not he's going to be arrested, that would be a law enforcement call. I can't answer that. But she certainly should work with the advocates, uh, the domestic violence or sexual assault advocates, uh, get a restraining order and get out and get away and be safe. Actually, I suggest that you all get a, uh, um, a law enforcement officer yeah. uh, to, to, to do a follow-up. Um, I'd be very interested in that. Um, I have spoken to um, DAs in preparation for the piece that I wrote on this for domestic shelters and, um, and police officers, and they basically were kind of like not that familiar with it, you know. So I, I think that this is, is still a problem which has not been adequately named. We know about drugging strangers, which is also really hard, you know, at a bar or something, which is also really hard to prosecute. But um, the drugging of intimate partners is, is relatively unfamiliar and, and undiscussed and un, not understood. Yeah. Yeah. So Lisa, Lisa is correct with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to go down to the next question here. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, paranoia in relation to this topic? Um, we see a lot of clients who believe they've been poisoned, and we later discover that they've developed severe paranoia. Um, often they have been accused, they have accused advocates of poisoning them as well because they believe it continued. Um, how should advocates help these uh, specific folks? Maybe I'll start with that one. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that the situation of domestic violence and domestic abuse and coercive control is so terrifying, shows up in so many ways, it can lead a person to feel crazy. I mean, we know that's, that's gaslighting, right, is to make a person feel crazy and make people around that person feel like they're crazy. 
And so it's, it's easy to become paranoid in that kind of situation. So much has happened, so much is unexplainable, um, so much is painful and terrifying. The person may not be sleeping well. And, and so I think that a, a certain um, degree of paranoia is understandable and, and it may not be paranoia. You know, it may look like paranoia um, to other people. I remember a woman saying that her husband had put um, microphones in her mouth, in her teeth. And that was, you know, had gotten the dentist to do that. And that was the way that she understood how he knew what she was saying all the time. Now that sounds kind of paranoid and crazy, but probably he had, you know, just put microphones in her, um, turned on the microphone on her phone and her computer and maybe had a camera somewhere, but that made a, a crazy sounding, paranoid sounding person. And then of course there also are people who do have paranoid um, tendencies so, um, I mean, I don't know that I have any particular insight here, except to say just to um, get the person to safety, to help them get some um, relaxation techniques, to see if you can build relationships of trust, to get them a connection with a mental health provider. Um, and yeah, that's about about all I can think of. Diane, I don't know if you have any, I mean, if, if they're truly paranoid and maybe even psychotic, then getting them to a mental health provider is really very, very important. Yeah, I totally agree. The mental health issues are horrendous um, and it can happen to anyone and getting that mental health provider is really important wherever you can get that counseling and with whoever. And I hope that the advocates know how to do this and help them manage or uh, um, get into uh, the follow-ups with these. Absolutely. That horrible state that a person is in, maybe when they first contact the agency and, and you know, years of abuse have reached their peak and they can't take it any longer and they haven't been sleeping and they haven't been eating right and, and they've lost contact with all their friends and, and people can get in a very excited and difficult um, state that might look kind of paranoid. And, and I just always try to keep in mind that I'm seeing a person at their very worst moment and that better days are ahead and that it will look different in a year and two years and five years, because sometimes people feel like this is forever, this crazy feeling they have. Um, but I really, I believe in recovery and I, and I really do my best to communicate that. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I think what I took away from that is that idea of this may just be how they're interpreting the, the, the situation and that, you know, you kind of have to start by believing them and, and just build that trust and build that relationship and and help them find safety. I think that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, let's see. So when you talk about drugs um, are also cover, uh, excuse me, when you talk about drugs, are you also covering deliberate uh, poisoning with the intent to kill? Uh, we, I don't know that, um, you know, for a follow-up question would be, you know, what kind of poisons uh, could look like large salt flakes in food. So there's obviously, there are some, some more ill intent than just to, you know, sexual assault or any of the other things you spoke about. Um, can you speak to that as well? I just say it happens. Yeah. It does happen. Yes, Lisa is correct. And this is really difficult if there's never been any reports, um, if no one is concerned from the family about why she's sick, why is this always happening? Um, and if you're in a place in the United States uh, that doesn't have a, um, uh, I don't know how to say this nicely, law enforcement is not in tune with potential drugging. Um, it might be a rural area out in Arkansas, Montana, Minnesota, and they just don't even think about uh, all these horrible things. Uh, it will be, it will happen. And I have to say that I know personally of cases where this has happened, where someone was um, poisoned by their partner and they just got sicker and sicker, bedridden. And um, in one case, she overheard her daughter saying, uh, her husband saying to her daughter one day, you know, mommy may not be with us for much longer. And she, it suddenly like clicked and she um, somehow contacted a family member, got out of that relationship, took her kids with her and recovered. She said she'd gone mm -hmm. from being this very sickly person over, over a long period of time to being well. Um, 
So yeah, this is a big worry and it's really not mostly what we're talking about, but it's important to look at poisoning. Yeah. Well, I realize here we, we've reached our, our time. I do have, we have one more question. I just want to sneak in there um, for Lisa. Um, where can people find your book? Oh, thank you. Um, it is um, available um, through the publisher. It is available through that uh, any out online outlet. Um, so if you um, Google the name, you'll definitely find uh, a place to, to, to get it. It's, um, it used to be at Barnes and Nobles, and I'm sure you could order it online through them, but I don't think it's in stores anymore. It's available in Spanish, um, two forms of Chinese and Japanese as well. well. Fantastic. We'll make sure that we include a link in the shared resources folder so people can find it there as well. Um, Dan or Lisa, anything that you'd like to add before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think that's it. If you have any questions, uh, Ashley, there, feel free. They can email me. Um, I'll help them the best that I can. Great. Yeah, I'll include that, that email address then in the shared resources folder as well. And I guess I just want to say, you know, thanks to Diana, Ashley, Domestic Shelters. And I just want to express my deep, deep admiration and gratitude for um, forensic nurses, for advocates, for all of you who work um, with people who've been victimized um, by domestic abuse. And, uh, you know, together we will make a difference. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you again, Lisa and Diana, for joining us today. Uh, and thank you for everyone who tuned in. Uh, just some quick reminders before we wrap up. The webinar uh, was recorded today and will be available on our website within the next week. Uh, we also will uh, update the transcript, uh, send out a certificate of attendance, and like I mentioned, have a shared resources folder uh, with the various links that we've shared today. Um, and again, if you are calling in right now, send an email to info at domesticshelters.org uh, so that we can add you to that distribution list. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and conclude today's presentation. Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs>